Gentlemen, thank you for your patience. Uh, welcome to, uh, to the Wilson Center. I'm delighted to, uh, uh, to welcome you here to this event sponsored by the Mexico Institute and by the Inter-American Dialogue. My name is Duncan Wood. I'm the director of the Mexico Institute. Um, I am very, very excited today about today's program. Um, uh, a number of, uh, of real experts on the energy sector, and particularly on the Mexican energy sector here. Um, I'd like, first of all, to welcome uh, Lisa Vasidi, who is the uh, director of the energy program at the, uh, the Inter-American Dialogue. Uh, an old friend of mine, uh, back when she was a journalist, she used to call me at uh, all times of uh, day and night, bugging me about information about Mexico. And now she calls me all times of day and night to bug me about doing event events together. So uh, nothing really changes there. Um, but uh, I'd like to welcome you officially to, uh, uh, to the think tank world here, Lisa. I know you've been in the job for a few months, but it's the first time we've actually had done an event together. And so uh, congratulations on all the, uh, the work that you're doing over there at the Dialogue. i um, also like to welcome uh, Jeff Epping. Um, Jeff and I... I got together a few weeks ago um, to discuss Mexican energy, and I discovered that he is a real expert on, uh, on issues of, uh, of, of geology. Uh, and so I thought it'd be a lot of fun here to have Jeff come in and talk about the geological, geological uh, potential that exists in Mexico as a way to kick off our discussion. Um, Marcelo Morales, uh, an old friend of mine from, uh, gosh, now about six, seven years, I guess, we've been working on the issue of, uh, of energy reform, has been a participant in a number of round tables and, uh, and working groups that we've done through the Wilson Center uh, and uh, Andy Tam in Mexico City. Marcelo is, uh, is a partner at Energia in, uh, in Mexico City, um, uh, a former uh, employee of, uh, of Pemex and, uh, uh, and an expert in international relations as well uh, for his undergraduate uh, degree um, and, uh, and a, and a part-time professor as well, uh, if I may say so. Um, and then uh, last but not least, uh, Fluvio Ruiz, um, again, a very dear friend of, uh, of ours. Um, Fluvio is uh, one of the, the leading experts in Mexico on the issue of, uh, of oil and gas. Um, he is a, a counselor, uh, a consejero for, for Pemex, um, is a very, very well-known voice in the, uh, in the world of oil and gas in Mexico and internationally. Um, has been to Washington on a number of occasions <laughs> and uh, is uh, a very, very, we very well-respected uh, uh, authority on, on the issue of energy reform. Now, back in December of last year, as you know, once the uh, constitutional reform was passed, a lot of us who have studied this for a long time said, this is where the hard work really begins. And I guess, and I, 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 I put myself into this, this category, a lot of us didn't understand how hard the work would be to actually get the secondary legislation passed. Uh, yesterday, um, June 23rd, we were supposed to actually conclude the debates in the, uh, uh, in the Chamber of Deputies over uh, energy reform. And of course, that hasn't happened for a variety of reasons. But the hard work that's taken place so far and the hard work which is yet to come has been exemplified uh, as well by the uh, willingness of the three major parties to reach out to the world to try to explain their positions. Over the past few months, we've had visits from the PRI, the PAN, the PRD, um, to the Wilson Center and to co-sponsored events between the Wilson Center and the Atlantic Council, all of whom, uh, all, all of the, those visits were designed to discuss the party positions on energy reform. Um, and most recently, of course, we had the visit from uh, uh, PRD leader Jesus Zambrano, who made it very, very clear that the, uh, the PRD uh, is, is not opposed to the idea of reform as such, but is opposed to this particular reform and the secondary legislation as it stands right now. And it gave uh, real emphasis to the, uh, the intensity of the political debate that still exists in Mexico. This is far from being a done deal. It's far from being over. Um, the PRD, of course, is still committed to the idea of a consulta popular at some point in 2015. Um, and we will hear more about that from, uh, from both Fluvio and from Marcelo, about the, the political dimensions of this debate in Mexico. One of the things that I find most fascinating is, of course, the, uh, the element of issue linkage which is going on right now. The, uh, the, the PAN party is linking together um, political reform and energy reform, not because they're opposed to energy reform, of course, but because this is a very smart negotiating tactic to get what they want because they understand that this is the priority for the government. Um, we see other dimensions which are very, very important in this debate which are going on right now. Um, uh, one of them is the nationalist temptation which, which still exists uh, in Mexico to try to reserve some of the space for national companies, in particular the national oil company. And this is controversial in international investment circles. It's partly controversial in Mexico, although I have to say that I subscribe to the idea that this reform can only be a success if 
Pemex is successful out of this, if Pemex becomes a more vibrant and successful company. There is the temptation of maintaining not just national control, but governmental control, control by the state in Mexico. And I think we've seen this on a number of occasions during the debate over, over energy uh, and beyond in terms of economic policy, that there still exists a very strong temptation from the part of the Mexican state to, uh, to engage in a, just a little bit of dirigisme, um, to maintain that control so that they can say who gets what, when, where, and how. However, having said that, all of these, uh, these caveats, um, and uh, I think we, uh, my colleague Chris Wilson and I uh, sort of laid a lot of these out actually at the end of, uh, of last year in a, in a little op-ed we wrote for the Beyond Bricks blog on the, with the Financial Times um, when we said, hello 2014 for Mexico, the hard work starts now. The opportunity is still enormous. Uh, the opportunity for investors is enormous, of course. Uh, rarely a couple of days go by without a phone call, an email to my office from people saying, you know, we've heard that something big's happening in Mexico. And I say, well, good for you. You're a little bit behind the times. But anyway, <laughs> um, yesterday I had a meeting in my office with a chap from London who was saying that, uh, you know, I wasn't convinced to begin with, but then I saw just how much excitement is being generated here. And you can't get left on the sidelines of this. So you see this really headlong rush towards Mexican energy right now because the opportunity is there for investors. The opportunity is, of course, there for Mexico. Uh, an opportunity to really not just turn around its energy sector, its oil and gas sector, but to have that dynamic impact upon the rest of the economy, to create employment, to invest in infrastructure, to lower energy prices, ideally. And that has been one of the key arguments of the government. Whether or not it transpires in that way is, uh, remains to be seen. And of course, the opportunity for Pemex, and I know that, uh, that Fluvia will speak a little bit about this, the opportunity for Pemex to really break out of the, uh, of the stagnation that we've seen in the company over the past uh, decade and a half, and to revitalize the company and to make it into a competitive uh, national oil company. With that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Jeff Epping, who is the, uh, the president and founder of Aegis uh, Company, who's going to talk to us about the, uh, the potential on a geological level there in Mexico. Jeff, thank you very much. Thank you, Duncan, and uh, buenos dias. Get my slides up here. What I'm going to address is below ground issues. I actually concentrate on the geology and the resources. That's the foundation. Uh, for a large part of why we're here. And I think the title says it. Uh, we're going to look at the oil and gas resource endowment, as geologists call it. And it is a story of great geologic potential. I guess I hit the wrong button here. <laughs> there we go. Never the red one. <laughs> Never the red one. <laughs> This is a uh, slide that uh, comes out of uh, a publication by the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, and it shows the basins within, the, uh, within Mexico, if I can find the pointer here. And which one is? It should be up on the top here. Is this one here? No? Okay. There you go. The red one. It's the red one. The red one. <laughs> <laughs> Fluvio words. told me not to press the red one, and I, I believed him. But there, there are quite a number of basins. There are about 12 significant basins within Mexico, uh, all the way from the west, and then uh, in the east, both onshore in the mountains, mountain chain on the, on the east side, along the coast, and then the, the uh, offshore, both the shallow and deep uh, Gulf of Mexico. So what I'd like to do is spend a little time giving you an appreciation for what the resources are like, the oil and gas resources uh, are like. I'll concentrate on, on that, and uh, others on the panel will, will talk about the above ground issues, mainly the reforms. But if you look at these basins, you can see that uh, there are two areas within the country, eastern and the western, and these are of different uh, geologic ages. These are relatively young and not largely explored. explored. These basins are, depending on where, which uh, basin uh, one is looking at, have significant uh, production and explo exploitation and, uh, and resource development. Among those are the uh, Tampico Basin here and the Misantla Basin and then down into the Cereste Basin. 
And then the shallow offshore in Cantorell and uh, KMZ are down in this area. So out of the 12 basins, only six actually produce oil and gas. So there is still significant potential within the country. And within the basins that are being exploited, there's still significant potential as well. Now geologists love to tell stories, and a lot of the foundation of Mexico's resource endowment starts with the Cretaceous. It's the age of the dinosaurs, 65 million years ago and a little bit older. And as you can see, this is a geologic map from that period. And a lot of the oil in the US, Canada, and Mexico can be tied to the Cretaceous seaway setting. If you look at, uh, I'm sure everybody's heard about the, the gas shale and the oil shales that are being developed in the US. If you put a map of those on top, they map very much with the Western Interior Seaway. And as you can see, that extends all the way down into Mexico. The Chichilub Crater, which uh, ended the age of the dinosaurs, uh, is located here. And that actually ended the Cretaceous period. So when you put the map of Mexico and its basins on top of this Cretaceous map, you can see that Mexico's uh, geology is actually the foundation of North America. I've done a lot of work in Mexico, looked at a lot of seismic and wells and uh, for uh, geologic interest. If you look right here, if, you want, if one wants to define the southern end of North America, this is where it is right here. It's where the mountain chains that form the, uh, the Rocky Mountains, so the uh, Sierra Madre Oriental, which extends up into the Rocky Mountains and then up into Canada all the way to Alaska, that mountain chain is present well into Mexico and stops here. And that is the, that's the southern edge of, of North America. And it does have um, geologic impact. Most of the oil basins are north of that area. And you get uh, south of this and further to the east, you're in a more Caribbean-dominated tectonic regime. So Mexico really sets it up for North America. And you can see the coincidence of the Western Interior Seaway and the basins, uh, the Eastern basins. As I said, the, the Western basins in Mexico, which are not largely explored, but do have potential, are much younger. These are 65, well, probably 80 million years old and less. These are probably on the order of six, seven million years. So when we look at, at estimations of the resource endowment itself, Pemex has made estimates, and that's where this, these data come from. If we look at billions of barrels of oil, trillions of cubic feet of gas, and then to put them on an even keel, we, we uh, convert the gas into oil and have billions of barrels of oil equivalent. You look at the produced volumes, it's been about 55 billion barrels of oil equivalent. The reserve base, so-called 3P, this is what's been proved, what's possible, uh, probable, and what's possible, represents about another 45 billion barrels. So this is sort of what could be drilled in the near future. The yet-to-be-discovered conventional is another 55 billion barrels. So you'll note that it's larger than the 3P estimate. And then the yet-to-be-certified unconventional is another 60 billion barrels. Now these estimates, uh, we've, as a firm, we've done these sorts of estimates, resource estimates. They're uh, somewhat uncertain, especially as you get further down into um, a profile like this. Uh, the geology in, in Mexico is, is really quite good, and I wouldn't be surprised if these uh, estimates uh, underestimate things to a certain degree. At the end of the day, as a target for future technology, there's always oil left in the ground that's not economic, and that runs on the order of about 50 percent of the oil. So you look at the resource endowment, uh, 435 billion barrels of oil equivalent. 
about 160 is left yet to be produced, and that's a very large resource endowment. So in the last 100 years, 41 billion barrels of oil and 72 TCF of gas, that's 55 barrel, billion barrels equivalent, have been extracted, and 160 billion barrels are remaining. The three areas in which this occurs are the onshore conventional, then the offshore, both the shallow and deep, and then the unconventional. So let's take a look, look at those a little bit more. By and large, to be honest, if you, if you go to Google Images and put up Mexican oil fields, there isn't a lot of information uh, in the public domain on, on uh, Mexican oil fields. And uh, you can see that in this map. Uh, the basins that I showed in the earlier map are, are represented here and then the oil fields, and here we can see a depiction of Chicontepec, which is a very large complex of fields in Mexico, uh, a major, major area of production. In this uh, cartoon map, it's depicted here, but you see a little blow up here, and this is the actual outline of the Chicontepec field, and uh, then the Golden Lane. There's a whole series of fields. This is a beautiful, a world-class example of what geologists called a reefal complex. This is, in ancient times, was a very large reef. And it's like a crown. On the edge of the reef is where all the oil fields are. That's where all the porosity and permeability is. And that's where the oil is migrated to and then been drilled. These have beautiful expression and seismic. Uh, you can see the, if you've been to Utah or in Mexico and you see some of the uh, reefal complexes and cliffs, these look like that in the subsurface. And so the oil resides on the edge of the reef in a string of field. Up to the north, there are a couple of basins. The Burgos Basin, which is really just ex an extension of the basins we see in the U.S., or maybe turn it around the other way. The U.S. is an extension of what occurs in Mexico. And so uh, gas shales and oil shales that are present uh, in this area certainly cross the border. And then there's the Sabinas Basin, which is dominantly gas prone. Uh, the basins down here, Tampico and Misantla, which we covered. The Veracruz Basin, which tends to be gas prone. Then the uh, Sureste Basin and Macuspana Basin here, which is gas prone. And then some of the fields. These aren't to scale, but uh, here we see two of the biggest, Cantarell and KMZ. Now let's look at the offshore for a minute. The offshore in the U.S. has really only developed since the late 1980s, the, the deep water, certainly. The, uh, the shallow water has been developed for a long time. But the deep water, it's been relatively recently. It's been the last couple of decades that it's been uh, really developed. And uh, this is a depiction. I actually found a 1994 Encyclopedia Britannica map, which came in very handy. And I overlaid some of the, uh, some of the other maps here. Here we depict all the platforms that are in the Gulf. And this is a good surrogate for the fields themselves. You can see that there's quite quite a few fields here in the relatively shallow water and then getting into the deeper water. This is the, uh, the white dots here actually represent leases. They turn out to be for Chevron, but uh, so the density of, of leasing is actually greater than this. But what I wanted to illustrate is uh, there is production in the shallow waters going into the deep, deeper water, deep generally uh, being defined as a thousand feet or 600 meters, uh, and then uh, you get into the ultra-deep water. There are additional plays, the Miocene trend and the lower tertiary trend, which extend through here. And uh, here, drilling occurs in depths of, of a mile or greater, and the well depths ultimately on the order of 20,000 feet or greater. They're very, uh, very large-scale developments. But as you can see, that trend moves on. Here's the border which comes in through here, and the Perdido uh, fold belt extends on into Mexico. And there have been discoveries on the Mexican side, as you can see from the, I hope that shows up uh, well enough. 
that there are structures or oil accumulations that extend into Mexico. So then as, you, as one extends further uh, south, this is the reefal complex that actually uh, extends on shore as well. And then uh, the production in Cantarell and, and KMZ. Uh, there's good potential along the, uh, the southern edge of the, uh, the, the uh, near offshore, the shallow water, down to about 600 meters. But also in the, uh, in the deep water. It hasn't been explored to any great degree to this point. A different type of play is the so-called shale plays, and this is both oil and gas. If one looks at some of these plays, depending on where they are in terms of a pressure temperature regime, they will produce either oil or gas. Now, gas prices currently and oil prices are uh, such that the um, gas prices and oil prices are such that the differential between the two is, uh, is great, and the industry tends to focus on the, on the oil sections uh, of the play. If you look at the Eagle Ford, the oil leg is up here, and then the deeper portion is the gas play, but that extends into, uh, into Mexico here in the, um, in the basin here. And then in the, uh, in the Sabinas Basin, uh, the Eagle Ford and the La Casita are present. These are Cretaceous formations. And then down into uh, the Masantla Basin, Tampico, Masantla uh, Basin, the Pimienta and the Tam uh, Tamaulipas, and the Maltrata. These are all very prospective uh, plays for, uh, for recovery of hydrocarbons, both oil and gas. It'll depend specifically on the geology. But Pemex estimates that the, that the unconventional resources are 141 TCF of gas and 32 uh, billion barrels of oil. So these are sizable. And it's potentially the world's fourth largest unconventional resource. So if you compare the the area in which uh, Mexico is dealing with and look at that compared to the U.S., you get, a, get an idea of the, of the density of resources that Mexico has. So setting the stage, I want to give you an appreciation of the, uh, of the magnitude of Mexico's oil and gas endowment. Geologically, it's very healthy. They're, the target is there. The sector is opening up and the industry is paying notice. It's probably uh, an understatement. And as Duncan alluded, Pemex is, uh, is in the game. And uh, this is a quote from Gustavo Hernandez, who heads up Pemex's EMP d division in the Wall Street Journal recently. It says, competing with the best, you're going to uh, be improving. And that's a fact. And I think that uh, Pemex can and will uh, be in the game. It's in a very good position. It knows the geology best, uh, that's for sure, within the country. <laughs> so the development of the resources, uh, it's possible it could drip, uh, triple gas production to 20 BCF a day. Mexico uh, actually imports uh, gas currently, and that could be certainly reversed. And it could also reverse the decline in oil production. So in summary, Mexico has extremely good potential. Um, this is a world-class set of basins. It's a world-class environment. And I think uh, the world is anxiously awaiting to see what happens uh, with the reforms. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Marcelo. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, Marcelo, if you uh, could uh, give us a, an overview right now of where we stand on the, uh, the secondary legislation, the debate in, uh, in the legislature, um, and where you think things are heading. Sure. Well, first of all, Duncan, thanks a lot for inviting me and for setting up this great event. Great job. Um, we're, we miss you in Mexico, but I think you're doing a decent job over here, so, uh, <laughs> so no complaints. <laughs> um, well... 
Uh, first of all, I'd like to say, I mean, thank you, Jeffrey, for, for a great presentation. I think that, uh, that it is clear that Mexico does have the, uh, the, uh, the potential resources under, uh, underneath the ground to, uh, to reverse the, the, this decline in oil production that we've seen since 2004. The, uh, the remaining factor needs to be seen is how we can administer the above ground risk. So how can we, how can we um, organize the sector in such a way that these, uh, that, that the decline can be reverted and, and that the goals that were set forth by the administration um, when, uh, when presenting the uh, constitutional reform that was passed last year can be achieved. These, uh, these goals are uh, increasing oil production from uh, 2.5 million barrels where we've been stuck since 2009. So to put it in perspective, Mexico was producing uh, 3.4 million barrels at its peak in 2004, and then uh, the Cantarel field started declining and production dropped to, um, to 2 point, around 2.5. It was stabilized around 2009. And from 2009 until the present time, we've been producing around 2.5 million barrels per day. We haven't been able to increase that, although the, 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 the drop was, uh, was, uh, was um, stabilized. Um, so with the, uh, the reform uh, predicts that if, if fully implemented, it, uh, produ oil production is going to increase to uh, 3 million barrels a day by 2018 and 3.5 million barrels a day by 2025. Um, gas production is also set to increase from current production of uh, 6.3, 6.4 uh, billion cubic feet per day um, now to um, about 8 billion cubic feet per day in 2004, uh, 2018. And, uh, upwards of 10 billion uh, cubic feet per day in 2025. So in order to achieve that, first, uh, first things first, so we have to pass a secondary legislation, the, uh, the, um, the, um, the uh, uh, constitutional reform, as you all know, was, uh, is historic, it's very broad, and it, uh, it, it, it's a big success, it's a big event for the country, and the two main objectives that were set forth by the government in, 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 in undertaking this reform process were, on one hand, to open up um, all of the industry, all of the, the, the energy industry, power and oil and gas, so every link in the value chain to private investment. So that, that was achieved with, with this reform, with this constitutional reform. And uh, the, other, the other goal was to strengthen uh, uh, the state-owned companies, so Pemex and the CFE. That remains to be seen. I think that there is a lot more to uh, analyze and to see, and Fluvio is going to uh, to talk a bit more about that. But uh, at least in opening up to the private sector, it's been a big success. The uh, the constitutional reform was uh, was 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 uh, extremely good news for Mexico, I think, and it's uh, it's uh, bodes well for the future. So where do we stand now? The secondary the secondary laws are being discussed. Well, are we're starting to be discussed, and uh, and. Uh, we have seen a delay of about uh, maybe two months in, in, in where we should be in the, uh, in, in the legislative calendar from what we initially thought that they were going to be passed in May. Now I think we're looking at the end of July. What, what has happened there? Well, I think it's, it's a combination of factors, as, as Duncan said. On the one hand, the amount of legislation that has had to, uh, to, to, to be made in order to, uh, to present the initial secondary uh, 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 bill was huge. It's uh, 21 laws in total that had to be e either modified or made completely new. So that is a lot of work. And I think that uh, the, 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 the authorities took a little bit longer to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to prepare these, th th this package um, because they, they, uh, they didn't have the resources, I think, to, uh, to prepare this faster. So that accounts for a bit of the delay, the fact that the, the government was also trying to uh, to um, decide on very, very um, relevant and, and, and far-reaching uh, uh, issues, such as opening up of the markets. I mean, because uh, uh, one thing is open up, uh, opening up to private investment, and another thing is what are you going to do, which is not in the, uh, the constitutional reform, by the way, what are you going to do with the markets? So how are, are you going to, you know, electricity and, uh, and, uh, and gasoline prices or, 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 or uh, petroleum derivative uh, 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 prices are, 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 are set by the government, and they're controlled. And imports are controlled, so it's a, it's a very, very controlled market, and suddenly uh, uh, the, ex the, the expectation is that 
as you open up the private investment, you should live, free up the market, liberalize it. So how do you do it? Which timeline do you follow? Do you just free up prices? Well, the answer is no, because one of the main promises that the government had made for the, uh, to, to get support for the, uh, for the um, energy reform was that energy prices were going to drop. But if you just uh, liberalize prices right away, you may have the opposite, because it's going to depend on the differential between in the local controlled prices and the international uh, uh, um, market. So you may have the contrary. So these are some of the issues. And then how are you going to operate that free market? Um, um, for, for electricity, it has a, also a lot of, uh, a lot of other uh, consequences. So these are some of the issues that the government had to grapple with in, 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 in the first few months of the year. And so finally, they presented this package. And what has happened since is that uh, there was a political agreement that uh, the, uh, the energy reform, or the, sec the secondary laws, were going to be voted. And uh, the, the, the PAN specifically, the, the, uh, the, uh, the PAN, um, Basically, conditioned their their support to to this uh, to this law package, the, the the energy reform, the secondary laws, to uh, the passing of a uh, political reform and the passing of a telecommunic the, the, the secondary laws of the telecommunications reform. So this is basically where we are now. Um, the uh, the uh, political reform has uh, required a bit more time to pass. There have been some issues, uh, some thorny issues, that have. Uh, have been uh, resolved. Some others are being resolved currently, actually. And uh, the telecom reform is supposed to be voted on this week or next week. So my estimate is that uh, we should be discussing the, uh, the uh, secondary law package again um, um, during July, and that uh, the, the, the package should pass between late July and early to mid-August. So the, th those are the current estimates. I mean, a lot of things can happen, especially when you're talking about, you know, the, the, the amount of work that the legislative uh, has, you know, the, 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 the Senate and the Chamber of Deputies have a lot of work and there's a lot of political issues in there. And there's, so there's a lot of ramifications to everything. So a lot of things can happen, but those are, I think, the best estimates so far of, 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 uh, of where we are. Now, looking a bit ahead of that, in order to really have a, a, a successful implementation of the reform, th th this is just the beginning. I mean, passing the constitution, the constitutional bill, and passing the secondary laws is very important, but it's only the beginning. I think the uh, the, uh, the the real work starts now with, with, with the implementation, and that really raises um, um, important challenges uh, uh, for, for for Mexico going forward, because I mean. In, in order to really implement a, a reform that is going to work, in order to really attract private investment, in order to really, really set the energy sector going again, to attract the investment, to generate the jobs, and to, uh, to, uh, to reach these goals that are pretty ambitious, I think, several ne things need to, uh, need to be done first. Um, I'd say that one of the main issues would be uh, with, with the regulation. So, so uh, after you have the secondary laws, the, uh, the um, the regulating uh, institutions are, are going to have to come up with with specific regulation to uh, to uh, which does not require any uh, uh, approval by Congress, but they're going to have to come up with regulations specifically implementing all of the secondary laws. And this is a process that is uh, lengthy, and that is uh, that is um, it's uh, it's also quite tricky. I mean, I think that that uh, you, you cannot create regulating uh, 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 you know. Uh, regulation and, and the institutions overnight, and that is that is a big challenge. I mean, in terms of of of, of, of uh, there's a need for to have clear and strong and effective regulation and and, and 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 governance without inhibiting investment and without being an impediment. So the the challenge here is that the uh, regulatory uh, um, institutions do not become a bottleneck for investment, but that they become very effective and very very efficient in doing their job. And that is easier said than done, I think. Um, there is also the, they, they also must guarantee that the process is going to be transparent and that there's going to be a level playing field so that there's not going to be a preference or a bias either towards Pemex or away from Pemex so that everybody is going to be treated the same in the, uh, in the, uh, in both the, uh, the, the permitting processes and, and the, uh, and, and, and the contracts. So to, to explain that a little bit more, the way that the uh, constitution was changed is that the upstream, so exploration and production of oil and gas, 
um, is going to be um, performed through contracts that are going to be bid out by the state, by the Ministry of Energy and the National Hydrocarbon Commission, whereas the midstream and downstream are, 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 going to be, uh, are going to be operated through permits. So then, you know, any, any, any private investor, any private company can just requ request a permit to build a pipeline or a storage facility or, uh, or a refinery, et cetera. So that, that, is, that is a more or less a difference, I mean, in, in very broad terms. So in that, uh, in, in that respect, the authorities, regulating authorities, need to create uh, um, competitive, also very competitive contractual and permitting schemes. Why, why is that important? That is important because the uh, energy industry is a global industry. The, the energy companies operate anywhere in the world, and, uh, and uh, it's very important that we in Mexico understand that if we do not offer um, competitive uh, scheme, contractually or, 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 or permitting uh, schemes, uh, energy companies are going to take their, their, their skills or technology and their, their, their budgets elsewhere because they are used to operating anywhere around the world. So there's nothing, really nothing special about the oil in Mexico. It's just oil. So um, there's a, there's a, I mean, I'll, I, I can talk a little bit more about what advantages and disadvantages uh, Mexico offers because, of course, we do have important challenges such as uh, security, um, but we also offer a, a very stable uh, democracy. We, o we offer a very stable uh, macroeconomic environment in which to invest. So, you know, there are pros and cons to investing in Mexico like anywhere else. But I think overall, Mexico uh, represents a, a very good investment opportunity as long as the regulations are, 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 are efficient, as long as the regulatory bodies are, are well constituted, and as long as the, uh, the uh, permitting and, contract and contractual schemes are, are adequate and competitive with the rest of the world. So um, another big challenge that is posed is, uh, is, uh, is in the human resource area. Um, Mexico's, the evolution of Mexico's energy sector is going to require us to have a, a, a specialized workforce, or it's going to require us to have develop a lot of skills we don't currently have and to uh, to uh, to have more people doing what very few people are doing currently so for example for the regulators it uh, it, it, it it does present a, a huge challenge just to uh, to give an example the national hydrocarbon commission estimates that they will need between 500 and 600 engineers full-time uh, um, in, 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 in the ranks in order to be able to effectively regulate the sector. Um, currently, they have about uh, 50 or 60, no? 50, 50 51. Yeah, F 50 engineers. So the remaining 450 to 550 engineers, you know, let's say that uh, th out of those engineers, they need 300 petroleum engineers. You know? The rest may be from other branches. Um, the problem is that in Mexico, we are having about uh, 140 to 160 petroleum engineers graduate e each year nationally. So you can start to see the challenge that this is going to pose because just only the National Hydrocarbon Commission is going to require about two years uh, of, of the entire class of, of, of petroleum engineers graduating from Mexico. I mean, Pemex is going to require more engineers. The private companies coming into Mexico are going to require more petroleum engineers. So, so the human resource challenge is, 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 is very big. I mean, and also you have to understand that it's not just a matter of, of, of recruiting a, 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 a graduate, uh, people that are just graduating from schools. You also need to have experience. And none of the regulators, of course, have the type of experience needed because Me Mexico has been in a closed market until now. So, uh, so they not only need to recruit the people, new people, but they need to acquire the skills and the experience very fast in order to, to operate a, a market such as, as, as has been uh, uh, um, designed by the, uh, the, the, the reform. So um, that is very important. Um, the Ministry of Energy, of course, will also, the, and the CRE, the Comisión Reguladora de Energía, which will regulate the midstream and downstream, is also going to require a lot of, uh, a, a lot of new talent and, and a lot of new skills. Um, Pemex, on the other hand, has a maturing labor force, as does much of the, uh, the industry worldwide. They have a generation gap, just like most of the, uh, the oil companies in the oil sector. 
there's a there's you know there's a a, a group of older very experienced engineers that are on the way out they're, they're 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 retiring as we speak they're going to be retiring in the next three to five years and then there's a group of younger engineers and in the middle there's a big gap you know because in the in, in the 90s you had the, the the price of oil was very low so nobody wanted to uh, study uh, uh, petroleum engineering or, or, or geology because it was not uh, fashionable to do so and it was not very lucrative to do so at the time when they when, when these people were in college so there's a big generation gap there and pemex needs to address that so um, um, uh, um, those are those are certainly important challenges. I mean, and they reach into the uh, into the need to have a better middle and higher education in in, in, in Mexico and, and 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 a host of other of, of other issues. So um, another another challenge has to do with the uh, with the security. I mean, as I already mentioned, um, security and the rule of law are major challenges, especially if you consider that. As we saw on Jeffrey's maps, a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the uh, the potential resources, especially for gas, are in the northern northeastern part of the country, which has been notorious for having very high crime levels and uh, uh, a presence of organized crime. And uh, and uh, and uh, th this is this is really a big problem. So uh, this is something that the country is going to need to address. However. Uh, it must be said that oil and gas companies are not foreign to to to, uh, to operating in very hostile environments. So, uh, so the the oil companies in the end are going to uh, you know crunch the numbers and and if it's viable to invest in Mexico, even though they need to have a small army, you know, um, um, looking after their facilities, and if the uh, numbers are are are, are if the numbers make sense, they will do it. But uh, that does not mean that the Mexican state has a has a large challenge ahead of itself in in in, in terms of uh, of security. Um, sustainability is another issue that is very important. Um, I think that the uh, the social and, and environmental concerns that are linked to uh, to uh, to the the energy sector, especially to oil and gas, are are globally are, are global uh, concerns. There's nothing new in Mexico. What we do need to, uh, to do in Mexico is to create clear guidelines. We need to create within the secondary laws and within the regulations. We need to create quantifiable requirements. We need to create effective prevention tools because I think prevention is the is the best tool. Uh, um, um, to uh, to uh, to avoid especially environmental problems, but also social problems, um, and agile remediation measures once you have a problem, be it social or environmental. So there's there's a there's a big uh, there's a tall order in in terms of sustainability to 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 guarantee that Mexico's uh, energy industry is going to be able to grow in a sustainable way. I think that this is another another important uh, uh, factor. All of these challenges, in the end, however daunting they may seem, um, really create very interesting opportunities, and 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 a lot of them create in, uh, interesting business opportunities for, for for companies that have technology, for companies that for, for, for people that have you know the vision, and for uh, for uh, for individuals and, uh, and and organizations that have the uh, the uh, the ability to seek out the opportunities. There are tremendous business opportunities, not just in the traditional oil and gas sector, but also in a lot of these areas where I, where I was talking to you, so in, in human resources, in, in, in environmental protection, environmental technologies, in, uh, in, um, in social, also in social programs, in social uh, um, 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 management, there's a lot of opportunities in Mexico arising from the, uh, from the uh, reform in oil and gas. So uh, I think that it's, uh, it's a good time to be in Mexico. And, uh, and I think that uh, if we get uh, through this uh, implementation phase, it's going to be a huge success for the country. Thank you, Marcelo. <laughs> We're now going to turn it over to, uh, to Fluvio Ruiz. Fluvio will be giving his presentation in Spanish, but his slides are going to be in English. Entonces, Fluvio, si quieres uh, empezar. Well, uh, first of all, uh, good morning. I want to thank my dear friend, Don Cancud, for the invitation. Uh, don't believe what he said about me. He's, uh, too good friend. So, uh, well, as Duncan said, as I'm not uh, entirely sure that my English, my Veracruzano English is similar enough to the language you speak, I'd rather speak in Spanish. Bien, eh, quisiera rápidamente recordar lo que a mi juicio son las tres premisas fundamentales de la reforma constitucional aprobada en diciembre y que se reflejan en las leyes secundarias. Eh, sin duda, la premisa fundamental, la primera, es la decisión del Estado mexicano 
de introducir formas contractuales que necesariamente van a provocar un reparto de la renta petrolera que hoy se traslada, como veremos más adelante, hasta en más del 100% al Estado mexicano. El, al decidir eh, que eh, hubiera en México formas contractuales como la licencia o el contrato de producción compartida, evidentemente el Estado mexicano está apostando a que con la segunda paradigma que se cambia, que es el fin de la exclusividad de petróleos mexicanos, es decir, petróleos mexicanos, de hecho ya jurídicamente no es más el operador exclusivo de la nación, pues se tenga como resultado una aceleración tal de los trabajos petroleros y un incremento del volumen de producción, que aunque con las formas contractuales que dijimos este, se pueda compartir la renta, el volumen total de ingresos fiscales para el Estado se incremente en función de, esta, de este incremento de la producción. Me parece que esa es la apuesta fundamental de esta reforma, es decir, permitir la entrada de operadores internacionales necesariamente, que, cuyo trabajo provoque una, un incremento significativo de la producción, de tal suerte que aunque en ciertas formas contractuales se pudiera compartir la renta, los ingresos fiscales totales del, del Estado provenientes del petróleo podrían incluso incrementarse. Esa es, creo, la apuesta central. Bien, eh, rápidamente la descripción, la, el 30 de abril, ustedes saben, en México se celebra el Día del Niño, entonces como regalo este, a los niños legisladores, pues, pues les fue entregado un paquete eh, que trae nueve dictámenes que, en los cuales se clasifican 21 leyes, eh, seis dictámenes que son los fundamentales para diseñar la arquitectura institucional del, del sector petrolero, eh, se están discutiendo en el Senado, y tres que son los que tienen que ver con la parte fiscal y presupuestal por disposiciones constitucionales. Eh, la Cámara de Diputados tiene que ser la Cámara de Origen. Eh, por eh, cuestión de orden, evidentemente, eh, mientras no termine la discusión en el Senado, no tiene mucho sentido a tener la discusión en la Cámara de Diputados, puesto que lo que se apruebe en términos de la arquitectura institucional, las facultades y demás, necesariamente tendrá repercusiones en el paquete eh, fiscal y presupuestal, que por lo tanto se discutirá posteriormente en la Cámara de Diputados, posteriormente quiere decir prácticamente eh, en cuanto se termine la discusión en el Senado. Bien, ¿cuáles son a mi juicio, las claves de toda esta eh, reforma secundaria. Si lo que se desea es como aparentemente se sostiene, bueno, como se sostiene en el discurso oficial, el fortalecimiento de petróleos mexicanos en el nuevo contexto, hay dos temas que son completamente ineludibles y que son el régimen fiscal de petróleos mexicanos y la autonomía presupuestal. Eh, como bueno, todos seguramente saben, Pemex es el principal contribuyente para los ingresos fiscales del, del Estado. En la gráfica ustedes pueden ver la evolución de la contribución fiscal de petróleos mexicanos, que anda en torno a la tercera parte, generalmente un poco arriba de la tercera parte de todos los ingresos eh, del Estado, y en términos de su eh, participación en el Producto Interno Bruto, este anda en torno al 8% históricamente. Bien, ¿qué implica que, me que Petróleos Mexicanos sea el principal contribuyente? ¿Qué le implica a Petróleos Mexicanos? En la gráfica ustedes lo que pueden ver es la evolución de los resultados de Petróleos Mexicanos en lo que va del siglo antes y después de impuestos. La, la barrita en azul significa el resultado antes de impuestos y la parte en rojo eh, significa los resultados después de impuestos. Como pueden ustedes ver, solamente en dos años Petróleos Mexicanos ha tenido resultados positivos después de impuestos. En el año de 2006, que es el año inmediato posterior a la primera reforma importante del régimen fiscal de Pemex, de hecho se transformó la estructura, hasta 2005 estuvo vigente a lo que irónica y curiosamente se llamaba la red y que eh, provocaba est estos resultados en Pemex. Se cambió el régimen en 2005, eso permitió que en 2006 hubiera resultados positivos, sin embargo hay elementos como el límite de deducción del que hablaremos más adelante que se han mantenido desde entonces y que han dificultado que este régimen fiscal le permita a Pemex resultados positivos, incluso en el año fiscal 2012 
que es el año de los ingresos históricos de Pemex, es el año en que tuvo Pemex más ingresos, también es el año en el que enteró más impuestos. La, eh, el resultado positivo fue apenas marginal, aproximadamente Pemex tuvo utilidades por 905 mil millones de pesos, unos 85 mil millones de dólares, que lo colocan como la segunda empresa en utilidades antes de impuestos del mundo y una ganancia marginal de en torno a los 5 mil millones. Eh, en ese sentido, ¿qué hay en la reforma? En la reforma, en la parte fiscal, se hace una distinción entre eh, los asignatarios, que en este caso, para decirlo de manera muy sencilla, serían petróleos mexicanos, básicamente, y eventualmente las empresas subsidiarias que del, del emanen. Estos asignatarios toman esta denominación porque eh, aprovecharían, exp explotarían en el sentido amplio, las áreas que el Estado les diera como asignación. El Estado mexicano daría asignaciones solamente a petróleos mexicanos o empresas subsidiarias. Y en el caso de los contratistas, donde podrían caer en cualquiera de las cuatro modalidades que, entre otras, señala la reforma constitucional, como recuerdan son las licencias, los de producción compartida, los de utilidad compartida y los de servicios, que son los que actualmente se hacen, los contratistas estarían sujetos a un régimen fiscal caso por caso. Es decir, en cada licitación, la Secretaría de Hacienda establecería las condiciones económicas y fiscales que, a las cuales se sujetarían los contratistas y determinaría la, la variable sobre la cual se otorgaría el, el, el contrato respectivo. Eh, esto es relevante porque los contratistas no enterarían todas las partes, o, o mejor dicho, todas los, las contribuciones fiscales que hicieran los contratistas no necesariamente irían a la, al recientemente creado Fondo Mexicano del, del Petróleo. La parte de ingresos sobre la renta no iría, solamente irían los, eh, las royalties, por decirlo rápidamente. Hay un elemento también eh, que está en discusión. En la iniciativa viene la posibilidad de que, sobre todo en los contratos de producción compartida, no necesariamente PMI, que es el comercializador de petróleos mexicanos, comercializara el crudo que le correspondiera al Estado, se abre la posibilidad, a mi juicio, innecesariamente de que se licite quien comercie el, el petróleo crudo del Estado. Me parece que esto es olvidar completamente la componente geoestratégica del mercado petrolero y cuando vemos lo que ocurre en Ucrania, me parece que no viene mucho al caso. Eh, bien, ¿por qué es relevante la parte del fondo en términos fiscales? La ley del fondo establece que un mínimo de 4.7 puntos porcentuales del Producto Interno Bruto, su equivalente, sea lo que se destine a este fondo. ¿Cuánto es esto? Si tomamos los criterios de política económica de la propia Secretaría de Hacienda, para el año 2015, ese 4 punto, estos 4.7 puntos se equivaldrían a 826 mil millones de pesos. Petróleos mexicanos, para tener una idea, entregó al fisco en el año 2013, el año pasado, 864 mil millones de pesos. Es decir, si mantuviéramos, si se mantuvieran las previsiones económicas y en condiciones similares, el máximo, la máxima disminución de la carga fiscal de petróleos mexicanos equivaldría alrededor del 5%. Si ustedes suavizan la, la, la gráfica anterior, es esta, en 5% verían que tampoco habría una gran modificación. Es decir, Petróleos Mexicanos va a seguir siendo la base fundamental de los ingresos del Estado. No se avisora en el corto plazo una disminución sensible, porque evidentemente para que procedente, si bien la ley establece que esto es lo que se debe pagar de la industria petrolera, esto significa que esos 4.7 puntos son de la producción total de petróleo crudo en México. Sin embargo, esta producción no se va a incrementar sustancialmente en el corto plazo, de tal suerte que en los próximos cuatro o cinco años, Petróleos Mexicanos estará sujeta básicamente al mismo régimen fiscal, aunque la propia ley establece la posibilidad de que Pemex migre sus asignaciones a contratos. Sin embargo, como la Secretaría de Hacienda tiene la facultad, según la iniciativa, de ajustar el régimen fiscal, y ese régimen fiscal implica que al menos se enteren estos 4.7 puntos, pues entonces, independientemente del mecanismo fiscal concreto, Pemex pagará más o menos la misma cantidad que actualmente, de tal suerte que ahí podemos afirmar que no hay un cambio eh, significativo. ¿Por qué es importante la autonomía presupuestal, que es el otro lado, la otra cara de la moneda? Bueno, es importante porque en la propia iniciativa, y hasta parece que 
hubiera en ese sentido más autonomía para Pemex. Lo hay en el papel, pero difícilmente en, en la práctica. El hecho de que eh, la Secretaría de Hacienda siga poniendo el balance financiero de Pemex implica que, por, en consecuencia, impone también el techo presupuestal. Y veamos lo que ha ocurrido. Este es un ejemplo del año 2014. En 2014, en el Consejo de Administración aprobamos un presupuesto de 561 mil millones de pesos. En principio, el mecanismo vigente es, es el mismo que el mecanismo propuesto para fijar el techo presupuestal de Pemex. No hay variación. Bueno, la variación es que ahora regresaría a la Secretaría de Hacienda por Ministerio de Ley al Consejo. ¿Cómo? El titular la Secretaría de Hacienda como tal, hoy no está, está el doctor Videgaray, pero de manera individual podría no estar. Y es decisión del presidente. Ahora estaría de nuevo como, como este miembro el titular de la Secretaría de Hacienda. Y en ese consejo se vota el, el presupuesto de Pemex. Les decía, en, en 2014 se aprobó en 561 mil millones de pesos eh, a partir de la interpretación de un, de un artículo del reglamento de la Ley Federal de Presupuesto y Responsabilidad Sendaria, vean la secuencia, o sea, no está en la ley, está en un reglamento, y a partir de la interpretación de ese reglamento, que es facultad de la Secretaría, se establece un... Te, el, el reglamento lo único que dice es que Pemex deberá mantener su tendencia histórica de inversión. La interpretación que se ha asumido en los últimos años es que Pemex no puede rebasar dos puntos del PIB como este, in, inversión. Y a partir de esa interpretación se hacen estos recortes que ustedes pueden ver, que representaron 33 mil millones de pesos y que implicaron, sobre todo en el caso de refinación y petroquímica, una disminución de un torno del cuar, de un cuarto este, de lo que se había presupuestado originalmente en el Consejo para Inversión. Digamos, eso muestra la relevancia del tema de la autonomía presupuestal. Bien. Pero ¿cuáles son los puntos que, a mi juicio, se tendrían que analizar con mucho cuidado en la discusión que está en curso? En primer lugar es el, el, el tiempo, los periodos que establece la ley. Ya decía aquí Marcelo, ¿cuáles son las necesidades de la Comisión Nacional de Hidrocarburos? Bueno, no ha cubierto ninguna de las que hizo Marcelo y en septiembre va a decidir cuáles son los campos que le deja Pemex en la famosa Ronda Cero. Entonces, eh, creo que los periodos, los lapsos son muy cortos para el cúmulo de facultades que se le han otorgado a los diferentes actores que eh, van a tener un papel relevante en el sector energético, a mi juicio, y habría que revisar a la luz de la experiencia histórica, suelo traer a, eh, a colación el ejemplo brasileño, donde las reformas se hicieron en 1994-95, la Ronda Cero se hizo hasta 1998, aquí sin embargo se apresuran Creo que demasiado. En la ronda cero, que es ya el inicio de implementación, digamos la, la reforma inició su implementación en el 21 de marzo, es una forma plagada de fechas simbólicas, ¿no? se aprobó el 12 de diciembre, este, se, el 21 de marzo, el día de natalicio de Benito Juárez, se, este, se entregó la lista de Pemex para la solicitud de áreas de exploración, el 30 de abril se dio la secundaria, creo que el 16 de septiembre, no, ni no es broma, responde en la ronda cero, en, que es la de independencia. Entonces, eh, Pemex entregó la, la solicitud de áreas de e exploración. Esta solicitud, y por eso yo voté en contra del procedimiento, no se aprobó en el Pleno del Consejo de Administración, sino que la decisión fue trasladada al Comité de Estrategia e Inversiones del Consejo, donde este, que lo conforman dos funcionarios de la Secretaría de Energía, dos de la Secretaría de Hacienda y mi buen amigo Fortunato Álvarez, también consejero profesional. De tal suerte que de entrada... Petróleos Mexicanos endogeneizó una serie de decisiones del gobierno, porque en esa sesión del comité se presentaron dos escenarios, uno más amplio que el otro, y al final los miembros del comité, yo argumenté en contra, pero solo iba en calidad de colado, bueno, de invitado, este, de manera que eh, el comité decidió por el, el, el escenario más limitado que es el que finalmente se envió. Ahí ya, insisto, hay una interiorización de, por parte de Pemex de decisiones, de voluntades que son más bien desde el, que se andan más bien en, en el gobierno. Por supuesto, el tema del régimen fiscal, me parece que habría que se tendría que hacer una revisión en todo caso del límite inferior que establece la ley del fondo y al menos Petróleos Mexicanos debería poder deducir todos sus costos. Hoy existe un límite de deducción de 650 dólares por barril que a Pemex le cuestan más o menos 100 mil millones de pesos al año en, en, en pagos al, al fisco, al menos ese punto que se estableció en el año 2005 y no se ha modificado, tendría que revisarse. Eh, sin duda el tema de la autonomía eh, presupuestal, 
la investigación y el desarrollo tecnológico están completamente ausentes en la iniciativa de ley, a pesar de las necesidades que bien señalaba Marcelo, no hay ningún elemento, eh, lo único que se establece es el traslado del, de la parte de investigación del IMP a Pemex y algo que es completamente inverosímil, el, fija, se fija un límite al gasto en investigación y desarrollo tecnológico en el sector hidrocarburos de 5 mil millones de pesos. No conozco un país donde se fijen límites, por supuesto se fijan mínimos, pero nunca límites. El tema de la, del impacto social en las comunidades. Eh, eh, justamente en la lógica que les mostraba al inicio de acelerar los trabajos petroleros, se declaró a la actividad relacionada con eh, la exploración, el desarrollo y la producción de, de petróleos como de eh, interés social y orden público, es decir, tienen prioridad por las otras actividades. El problema de esto es que eso abre la posibilidad de conflictos, sobre todo en el sur del país. Eh, justo una de las seis eh, condiciones que ha puesto el PAN en, ya en el terreno estricto de los hidrocarburos, más allá de la parte política, es esta relación y esta retribución a los propietarios de las, de, de las tierras. Esto yo creo que no es tan grave en la parte norte, yo decía anoche en broma que si a un ranchero de Coahuila, como, como bien nos mostró Jeffrey, hay potencial shale gas, le ofrecen por su terreno el metro cuadrado lo mismo que en Manhattan, pues este, igual y lo vende. En el sur del país no necesariamente hay una relación comercial con la tierra, ahí sí como dice un comercial de, de tarjeta de crédito, ahí sí no tiene precio y creo que esa zona va a ser, de eso abre la posibilidad de eh, conflictos. El tema de los, de los reguladores también es muy importante. Hay una figura novedosa en, el, en la iniciativa de ley que es el Consejo Coordinador del Sector eh, Energético. Es una especie de consejo donde se coordinan los reguladores. Esto es sin duda una ambigüedad, esto coloca en una situación de ambigüedad a los órganos reguladores, porque un órgano regulador que a la vez tiene que ceñir sus responsabilidades a las políticas energéticas, en cierta medida pierde su naturaleza de regulador, según creo yo. Y sobre todo, ¿qué es lo que a mí te tendría que revisar? Las asimetrías que tendría que enfrentar eh, Petróleos Mexicanos. En la iniciativa original, a Petróleos Mexicanos se le podía revocar una asignación sin proceso. Simplemente se establecían las causales en las que podía incurrir Pemex y a partir de que la Secretaría de Energía determinara que caía en una de esas causales, le podía retirar, eh, revocar la asignación. En el dictamen que se aprobó en comisiones ya hay al menos un un proceso para esa revocación. A cambio, se introdujo la posibilidad de que la Secretaría de Energía puede pedir a Pemex y a la CFE también que ajuste sus actividades de tal manera, de tal manera que no bloquee la libre competencia eh, y eso, digamos, es un poco eh, a cambio. Sigue habiendo un peso eh, importante, como les mostraba, de la Secretaría de Hacienda en la determinación del presupuesto, sobre todo un peso que se va a manifestar en la práctica, insisto, en el papel pareciera que hay un relajamiento, lo cierto es que en la práctica, por la forma en que funcionan, y Marcelo también tiene experiencia en esto, la administración pública en México, el peso que se le da en el papel va a ser un peso muy significativo ya en la práctica. Una de las manifestaciones es que el balance financiero de Pemex, de Pemex es inflexible, esto tiene muchas implicaciones porque podría darse el caso que cuando ya se agota más o menos la disposición presupuestal, Pemex pudiera invertir o coinvertir con algún aliado en algún proyecto, sin embargo no podría hacerlo porque ya rebasaría este techo. Me parece que ahí tendría que flexibilizarse y al menos otorgarle a Pemex la misma flexibilidad que hoy por día tiene el propio gobierno federal, es decir, que eh, justificándolo puede rebasar en el caso del gobierno, su déficit público a condición de regresar en cinco años, es el lapso que le da, que le da la, la ley. Además, Petróleos Mexicanos mantiene una de las características que son propias de un monopolio público, es la obligación de desarrollar proyectos de impacto social. Insisto, eso es correcto cuando se trata de un monopolio público, tengo serias dudas de que eso sea correcto cuando Pemex va a tener que enfrentar la competencia. Pemex, conforme a la ley, podría seguir haciendo estos proyectos, más bien, estaría sujeto a la obligación de realizar estos proyectos. Y si bien se prevé que presupuestalmente haya partidas para cubrir esos gastos, lo cierto es, uno, habría que ver si esas partidas los cubren, y dos, de todas formas Pemex distraería tiempo y recursos humanos en hacer un proyecto necesariamente o por definición menos rentable que que, que otros. Y finalmente un tema que me preocupa particularmente y que viene desde la reforma constitucional y es el hecho de que Pemex no podrá escoger a sus aliados. La, los socios estratégicos de Pemex en los diversos proyectos serán 
en el, al final del día seleccionados por la Comisión Nacional de Hidrocarburos, lo cual es otra novedad de nuestra iniciativa de ley, no ocurre en ninguna parte del mundo que el regulador le imponga este, a quien sea, imagínense que aquí el poderoso regulador estadounidense le dijera a Exxon con quién se puede y con quién no se puede aliar. Pues bien, Petróleos Mexicanos estará sujeto a la decisión final de la Comisión Nacional de Hidrocarburos. En suma, ¿cuáles creo yo que son los puntos fuertes de este debate? En primer lugar es que el Estado mexicano tiene que decidir hasta qué modelo de, de sector hidrocarburos va. ¿Va un modelo con un operador nacional dominante? o va un modelo con un operador nacional que se convierte en un operador más. En función de la respuesta, son las características institucionales y legales que se le deben otorgar a Petróleos Mexicanos. Si vamos a hacer un modelo donde Pemex no sea el operador dominante, es perfectamente válido que se le impongan los balances financieros que de otra manera el propio mercado le impondría. Digo, Pemex no se podría endeudar a lo loco, el mercado mismo le fijaría un límite. O que le, este, también lo obligue a hacer los proyectos solo por su impacto social. Si vamos hacia un modelo en el cual Petróleos Mexicanos, la idea es que sea como Petrobras en Brasil o Estatoil en Noruega, que en el primer caso Petrobras sigue produciendo el 93% del crudo brasileño y está todo más del 80% del crudo noruego a 40 años, en el caso de Estatol, a 20% en el caso de Petrobras de la Reforma, pues Pemex necesita los elementos para hacer una verdadera empresa, una empresa integrada, una empresa dotada de una plena autonomía de gestión y presupuestal con una menor carga fiscal o al menos una carga fiscal similar a lo de sus potenciales competidores y con todos los elementos para participar en el mercado internacional. Petróleos Mexicanos es al final del día la quinta empresa productora de crudo, la onceava como empresa productora y su horizonte natural es el mercado internacional, pero necesita todos estos elementos. De otra manera, si Petróleos Mexicanos se, se debilita y se mantiene sujeta a excesivas regulaciones, el modelo mismo será inestable, porque hoy por hoy cualquier eh, operador internacional necesita o preferiría invertir en México en alianza con Pemex y si Petróleos Mexicanos no es un socio flexible y sólido, no sería un buen socio y sobre todo no serviría tanto al país. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Fluvio. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. Before we move it over to pass over the microphone to, uh, to Lisa, it sounds a little bit like sending uh, La Selección Nacional Mexico out on Sunday against the Netherlands, but tying their boots together first of all. It's uh, <laughs> going to be tough for Pemex under those circumstances. Lisa, to moderate the Q&A, and I believe you have a question to kick off with. Yeah, I had one question. Since we only have a few minutes, maybe we should take a few at once. Um, so I wanted to ask, um, I think that the government has um, promised, made a lot of promises that are very ambitious, you know, in, in part to get public support. So, for example, um, I think you said 3.5 million barrels a day of production in 2020. I've heard from a couple of people that this is really not realistic, given, you know, it could happen in the long term, sure, but in that timeline, all the things that need to be done. And then also what you mentioned about the prices. Um, the promise that prices will go down over the short term, they may actually go up. So, I mean, I'm wondering what are the consequences of, you know, let's say that these promises are not kept. Is what are what are the risks there in terms of public support? Uh, what needs to be done to maintain public support, not just excitement right now, but over the long term? So, I was wondering what your thoughts are about that. And then let's, if there are any questions from the audience um, in the back here. <coughs> Hi, thank you for, for the conference. Uh, my name is Cesar Rosales. I'm from Georgetown University. And my question is uh, somewhat related to what Lisa just asked, but it's uh, a little bit different. So what we saw after the crisis of 1973 is that the American government and companies started to look for exploration and production prospects in other regions of the world different to the Arabic Peninsula. What they found is that exploration costs were uh, significantly higher in, in the Caspian rather than in the Arabic Peninsula. So my question here is, um, how is, is, the, is the reform too broad, as you mentioned, and too loose, meaning how is um, the Mexican government uh, going to attract and retain investment and will the international companies be able to develop the economies of scale so that they continue investing in the country in the context that of 
price controls and local content rules and also political instability from the pan conditioning the reform. So I don't know, um, the, what, are, what are your views in, in this scenario? Thank you. Maybe we can take uh, one more over here. Hi, thank you. Um, just to follow on in the same line of questioning, I'm Dave Nelson with GE. And uh, the, the question again is the, the timeline for the increase in production related to um, investment of technology and capital by foreign companies seems to be the, the basic concept. It'll grow when you have the foreign investors come. So with the delay in approval of the secondary legislation, what's the timeline that you see now for um, when they will actually have the round, uh, the first rounds of bidding? And when and how quickly do you think production would be able to, uh, exploration at least, would start to be able to, to come online from foreign companies? And should the foreign companies be concerned at all about the prospects of a referendum seeking to overturn the, uh, the reforms in the first place? Do you want to answer those? Then? Sure. sure. I'll, I'll take a stab at, at a few of them. Um, well, First, uh, um, in terms of, uh, of uh, well, we, we can start with the last question. I think that uh, given the, I mean, the delays are not, are not that substantial. Um, if the uh, secondary law package can be passed, uh, as we are predicting, in, uh, uh, during uh, you know, the, the end of uh, July or the, or the first half of August, we are still uh, more or less uh, in, in, in good time. And I think that the government understands that there is uh, a lot of pressure to uh, to show results here, and uh, we uh, Mexico has uh, um, um, midterm elections next year, July of next year. So I think that they're going to do everything that is uh, in their power to have the uh, first round of bidding launched, maybe by the end of this year, you know, December of this year, and and, and have that uh, bidding round uh, uh, wrapped up by. Uh, May of next year, maybe just so so May or June of next year, right before the election. So that's, I, th I I mean that is something that makes political sense. Whether it can be accomplished or not is going to depend on uh, on, on a lot of other issues. But uh, that would be the first instinct, and that seems to be a a a, a um, an agreement among uh, uh, among a large uh, group of the uh, the, uh, the the industry uh, experts and the observers. So I think that the timeline. Should I mean w we should see some action uh, um, um, in terms of the bidding process by the end of this year? So um, that's I think the uh, the um, um, in terms of the uh, constitutional uh, uh, um, um, well not the constitutional in terms of the challenge the challenge to the secondary laws because not is, is not to the constitution anymore. I think Fluvio could explain that uh, a, a lot better. In terms of the question over here about the uh, the um, the 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 price controls the price controls would only affect would only affect so midstream and downstream because if you're talking about exploration and production you, you're getting oil and gas that can be exported and sold anywhere there there's no control if you're a company that's co that's going to Mexico and you're going to you win a bidding round you know uh, uh, and you start producing oil and gas it, it doesn't really matter that the that the prices for the final uh, 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 products are, uh, are are controlled because you can take your oil and gas anywhere in the world and you can sell it and market it. The problem is for the midstream and, and downstream investment. So how how do you do that? So um, if you are planning to uh, to as a private company to build a pipeline or to build a terminal in order to import gasoline or to build a refinery, how are you going to sell that product to uh, to um, to 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 the market or how are you going to sell that that, that product? Uh, um, to the gas stations if the price is controlled. So that, that is something that is being, that is being worked on. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not impossible to do, you know, it's, it's not impossible to do because all of the prices that Pemex refining, so the downstream area uses, are market prices. And, 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 and what happens is they, they produced with, with international uh, uh, um, market pricing always, and what happens is that is that in the end, when they sell that to the gas stations, which are mostly privately owned, although they are all Pemex brand, um, when they sell that, they either get a tax rebate or they get or, or they have to pay an incremental tax depending on how the 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 uh, the, the prices are, the controlled price is versus the uh, international prices. So that could be done, but there's also ma many it raises many questions on how 
how you can achieve efficiencies. So how can you be more efficient than the guy next to you, be it Pemex or be it somebody else, uh, um, if the prices are controlled, where can you where can you exhibit those efficiencies? So how can you really make the case for new investment, which is badly needed, by the way, in midstream and downstream? So it does raise a lot of questions. Sí, eh, yo agregaría que efectivamente a mí me parece que las metas que se han establecido de producción son demasiado optimistas. Yo, que incluso la la última que se ha manejado de 3 millones para, de barriles diarios para 2018 es materialmente imposible. Yo no veo de, 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 de dónde. Este, me parece que atrás eh, hay un optimismo más desbordado que frente a la Copa del Mundo. Eh, porque <risa> evidentemente no, no vendrían de los campos que hoy opera Pemex. Necesariamente, o sea, un incremento así de significativo no vendría, o sea, como le digo a algunos de empleo, no somos tan buenos como quisiéramos, pero no somos tan malos como algunos creen. Entonces, no, no hay manera de este brinco tan grande en tan poco tiempo. Entonces, yo sinceramente no, no creo que, que, que se alcance en 2018, coincido, que más adelante, sin duda, sin duda. ¿no? El tema de la, de la consulta, bueno, el, al final de cuentas, y, y lo comentábamos un poco ayer eh, aquí en, en una amable cena que nos invitó Duncan, eh, va a haber un momento decisivo eh, cuando la Corte reciba las, la solicitud de la consulta. En este momento ya hay ley secundaria eh, para la consulta, eh, ya hay un proceso oficial que han iniciado por un lado el, el Partido de la Revolución Democrática, por otro lado eh, Movimiento Regeneración Nacional, el que encabeza Andrés Manuel López Obrador, y eh, al, no creo que haya problemas para el requerimiento material, que son dos millones de, de firmas, el PRD mismo tiene tres millones de militantes, entonces eh, seguramente se conseguirán, hay hasta el 15 de septiembre, seguimos con las fechas muy simbólicas en nuestro país, el, 5 de, el 15 de septiembre se, como fecha límite se entregarían la ley establece 2% del padrón, estos son como 1.7 millones, pero bueno, la meta es entregar al menos 2. En fin, eso no es el punto. Se, se van a entregar las firmas, sin duda. Después, eh, el Instituto Nacional Electoral verificará que efectivamente sean ciudadanos de carne y hueso, que existen. Tampoco creo que haya problemas. El gran punto es el momento en que la Corte decida si el tema es sujeto de la consulta. Ese es el gran momento que, según los tiempos de la ley de consulta popular, sería hacia inicios de noviembre, mediados de noviembre tal vez, 20 de noviembre acaso. Y entonces, eh, eh, cuando la Corte diga, y si la Corte decide, ese es el punto clave, si la Corte decide que el tema es sujeto de la consulta popular, después pasaría a analizar la pregunta. La ley establece una serie de requisitos para la pregunta, objetividad, en fin. Este, y... Pero bueno, en todo caso corregiría la pregunta y esta se llevaría a consulta el mismo día que las elecciones intermedias, de tal suerte que prácticamente está garantizado el mínimo de participación que establece la ley. En México nunca ha habido una elección intermedia con menos del 50% y la ley establece 40% para que el resultado sea vinculante. De manera que de todos estos pasos, el clave, el que tiene la mayor incertidumbre es el, la decisión que tome la la, la corte. Y como estamos en época mundialista, no quiero de este, dejar de expresar este, algunas preocupaciones en torno a la ronda cero, que como ustedes saben es muy importante. Eh, y en general sí, sí me, me preocupa la actitud que puede haber desde la Comisión Nacional de Hidrocarburos, porque aún antes de que Pemex entregara su lista de áreas de exploratorias, y la semana pasada todavía, desde ahí se han emitido voces diciendo que no se le van a entregar a Petróleos Mexicanos lo que solicita. Evidentemente, esas expresiones no provienen de un sesudo análisis técnico, sino de un prejuicio ideológico, porque no hay ninguna revisión previa. Entonces, yo digo que es como si los árbitros que nos han anulado dos goles perfectamente legales, que no marcaron dos penaltis ayer, hubieran dicho desde antes que iban a hacer eso. ¿Quién les hubiera creído que eran errores humanos? O sea, de por sí hay un escándalo, pero bueno, les creemos que se equivocaron. Es muy difícil, yo creo que la SNH pone en entredicho su credibilidad cuando antes de emitir un juicio razonado, perfectamente apoyado en la verificación técnica de los requisitos, que por cierto nunca se especificaron, en ningún lado se dijo cómo tenía que Pemex que demostrar su capacidad técnica, financiera y operativa, nada más decía que la tenía que demostrar, pero no cómo. Pero bueno, sin que la respuesta provenga de ese análisis, Emitir de entrada la opinión, manifestar públicamente que no se le va a dar a Pemex todo lo que va a solicitar, 
insisto, empieza a parecerse más a un prejuicio ideológico que a un resultado objetivo. Thank you. I, I'm officially the referee here, and the time is up, but I'm going to take an executive decision and give uh, extra time here for this okay. match, um, because I think it's worth continuing. There's a number of uh, questions that still remain in the audience. So, uh, Jeff, I'd like you I to... I just want to add, uh, from the standpoint, technically, it's certainly possible to, to raise the production. Uh, we look at the experience in the U.S. I think it depends a lot on the regime that comes out of the legislation, how the uh, industry reacts to that. But there are a couple of uh, examples. Brazil... Offshore Brazil has been very successful in the industry coming in and raising production substantially, uh, where we had a, a, a state enterprise that uh, had to compete with the private sector, and it was very effective. And also one can look at offshore Israel, uh, a country with virtually no, very little experience in the hydrocarbon sector, and have had uh, very large discoveries offshore in a very short period of time. So this can be done. Not in three years. Yeah, actually, exactly. I think I, I, I think that what what Fluvio was referring to is that the uh, the goals. I mean, well, we all all certainly hope that our production is going to go well above three million barrels. Uh, the goal to have it by end of 2018. It's uh, it's a four four years basically, um, a little bit more than four years from today. So uh, really, is going to be four years from when the new uh, new new regime is implemented. I think that that I mean I I, I I do agree that there is some some low hanging fruit, especially in mature fields where we could where we could increase production maybe by a hundred, a hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand barrels. You know, uh, uh, um, by having new technology come in and very efficient companies come in to mature fields maybe in partnership with Pemex or mature fields that are not awarded to Pemex or abandoned fields. Um, but uh, to raise it by 500,000 barrels by 2018, I think it's it's a bit too ambitious, especially because no greenfield project. I mean, maybe some small onshore projects, but virtually no 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 uh, no greenfield project can take off in three and a half years. You know, for, from award, if, if we're, we're thinking that these fields or the first fields are going to be awarded in June of of, of next year, it's three and a half years. So it's uh, it's practically impossible to do that. No, so uh, so so. But but we do think. I think we all agree that the potential is there, as as you showed, to 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 really take production from uh, fr from the current 2.5 to. Uh, to three, three and a half and beyond, but it's going to take more time. That's the, the problem is the timeline. Sí, basta ver el ejemplo brasileño. Digo, los tiempos fueron varios años. I was just going to say, in the case of Brazil, um, it, even though production of the pre-salt went up very quickly, overall production stayed flat because other fields were declining faster than, than expected, and something like that could also happen in Mexico. I mean, you also have to look at what's happening with the existing fields. De hecho es lo que ocurre, o sea, eh, la disminución se explica por el agotamiento del yacimiento gigante de Cantarell, pero si viera, si Cantarell no hubiera existido, como dice un amigo, si Juárez no hubiera muerto, si Cantarell no hubiera existido, estaríamos hablando que México está produciendo cerca de un millón de barriles adicionales a partir de la declinación de la Cantarell, que inicia en 2004. ¿no? Can we take another round? Yeah. Um, Two questions. Dr. Mar uh, my name is Diana Negroponte from Brookings Institution. Dr. Mareles, can you explain to us what the liability is for deep water exploration in the Gulf? Can't find it in the law. And for Dr. Ruiz, the corruption in Pemex is talked about much. Can Pemex clean itself up itself, or does it need the Comisión or maybe Sener to help it clean? Um, we have a question in the middle back there. Thank you. Uh, Simon Whistler from, from Control Risks. Just following on from that question about Pemex, I just wondered more generally how, how prepared Pemex is as an institution for working with some of the, the big oil companies that, in theory, are going to come in. I mean, obviously, it's worked with international service companies over the past few years, but in terms of oil majors, it's a completely different ballgame. And so from an institutional point of view, um, human resources that Marcelo talked about a little bit as well, kind of how, how ready is it for, it for the changes that are coming? Let's take one other question over here. Hi, Kirk Scher with Clearview Strategy Group. Uh, two quick questions regarding technology and development. Obviously, technology plays an increasingly important role onshore and offshore. First, is Pemex limited in its selection of partners for exploration and development and also for technology? 
i.e., is there a separation between their potential selection of technology partners versus E&P partners? And second, if that is the case and they're barred from selecting technology partners, does the law contemplate the possibility of funding Mexican research institutes or Mexican universities that would pursue independent research uh, to collaborate with Pemex as so frequently happens in the U.S.? Let me start by, by answering that, uh, that uh, last question. Um, no, the, 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 the brief answer is no. Um, Pemex, Pemex will have, under the, uh, the secondary laws as they are, they, they would have, uh, Pemex would be limited in, in, in selecting its partners for, uh, for uh, exploration and production, as Fluvio explained. But uh, in terms of procurement, there is, no, there, there is no limitation. I mean, Pemex is going to have a, uh, a uh, differentiated uh, uh, procurement regime from the rest of the government, which means that it's going to be able to uh, do its procurement procedures more efficiently and more in line with, uh, with the best uh, uh, practices, uh, uh, international practices, whereas uh, currently it is limited uh, um, and historically it's been, it's been very limited in, in, in its procurement processes because it needs to follow the same procedures as the rest of the government, which, which are very slow, cumbersome, and over-regulated. So uh, in terms of procurement for, 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 uh, for, um, for acquiring the technology, um, it's not it's not limited. So uh, so th there is no limitation in that regards. Yeah. Um, I, I I can answer a deep water question as well. I mean, in in, in terms of the liability, you mean the uh, the uh, the the exploration risk or the uh, yeah. Oh okay 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 okay. Well the uh, the the secondary laws do uh, do um, I mean. The, the specifics of the liability are going to be in the contracts, but the uh, but the secondary but, but the secondary law does does have some uh, some some very clear guidelines on what the liability for the uh, for, for the contract holders will be in case of, of, of an accident taking place for sure for sure. So the the the, the main guidelines are set forth in the secondary uh, 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 regulations, but the specifics are going to be in the uh, in, in the contracts themselves. So and and. I, I must also add that uh, that in terms of regulation, there's a, the, the, there's going to be a, a new agency, uh, specifically an environmental agency for the for, for the oil and gas industry is going to be created. This is going to be an independent agency that's going to be uh, is is going to be located within the Ministry of uh, of the Environment. So it's not is going to have it's not going to uh, to have anything to do with the uh, Ministry of Energy. It's going to be independent from that. It's going to be independent from the uh, f f from the National Hydrocarbon Commission, from Pemex, etc. So there is going to be a new environmental uh, agency that must be created by the end of this year. Uh, must be created by the end of the, by, by the end of this year. So um, it's going to have you know budgetary autonomy and uh, and. Uh, so, so, so I think that is good news because we're going to have a specialized agency that is going to be uh, 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 um, looking after the, uh, the the environmental soundness. Well, it's it's, it's for industrial uh, industrial uh, security and industrial safety and uh, and environmental protection. So I think the fact that we have a specialized agency for the energy uh, for the oil and gas industry is 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 a very good sign for that. Yeah. So I mean, of course, there is there is a lot of concern. There is a lot of concern on the U.S. as well, because as we saw with uh, with with the with the uh, Macondo incident, um, the, the the Gulf is a is a shared resource, you know. So uh, so uh, any any accident in, uh, in in Mexico could have a large impact on on on, on U.S. waters and, and and the coastline. So I think that everybody is very much aware of that. Pemex has actually implemented. A lot of the, uh, the 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 recommendations after the uh, the the, uh, the 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 Macondo incident, Pemex has has uh, 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 had uh, consulting from a lot of the same experts and companies that uh, that, that that BP uh, hired uh, after the incident in order to change and to perfect its its uh, its operations and its uh, its its practices. And Pemex has done uh, uh, substantial modifications to its uh, to to its practices after the incident in order to prevent it from happening on this side of the border. I mean, that's just speaking of Pemex. <laughs> parte institucional, como ya dijo bien eh, Marcelo, sí, efectivamente eh, para los aliados, al final eh, la CNH es quien decide 
eh, tomando la opinión de Pemex, pero no dices que sea favorable, o sea, independientemente de lo que diga Pemex, es al final la Comisión Nacional de Hidrocarburos. En el tema de, de el apoyo a la investigación, ha habido también una actitud ambivalente desde el Estado mexicano. En 2005 se creó, con el cambio de régimen fiscal que les mostraba, el derecho para la investigación científica en el Instituto Mexicano del Petróleo, que fue la tremenda cantidad de 0.05% del valor de la producción, o sea, 20 meses menos de lo que destina Brasil, por ejemplo. Pero bueno, ese fue un inicio. Y con la reforma de 2008 se amplió a 0.65% del valor de la producción dividida en tres fondos. Una parte que seguía siendo directo al Instituto Mexicano del Petróleo, la mayor parte, que es como 60% del total, que va al Fondo CENER con Acid Hidrocarburos, y una del orden del 20% del 100% que esto represente al Fondo CENER con Acid Desarrollo Sustentable. Sin embargo, durante los últimos tres años, en la ley de ingresos que se aprueba anualmente en el Congreso, se establece siempre un párrafo que le disminuye los primeros dos años 3 mil millones, el último año de plano 5 mil millones de pesos a este fondo, que de hecho ahora lo que se está haciendo en la iniciativa es legalizar, digamos, establecer esos recortes que se hacen a la investigación científica y tecnológica anualmente ya quedarían establecidos por ley. O sea, aparentemente el Estado mexicano, al Estado mexicano le preocupa invertir más de 5 mil millones de pesos, lo cual llama mucho la atención. Este fondo permite eh, tener, eh, a, apoyar las necesidades que establece el propio Pemex. En este momento hay 27 líneas. Yo formo parte también de, de ese comité, eh, del comité que evalúa los proyectos. Eh, hay 27 líneas de investigación que se están apoyando. Hay una parte que va también para la formación de recursos humanos. Y eh, el problema, y ahora me muevo a la parte institucional, es que en Petróleos Mexicanos, al carecer de autonomía de gestión, es muy complicado aprovechar estos apoyos. O sea, eh, por aquí hay una futura becaria en el, la sala, este, no diré su nombre para que no le pidan que le invite a comer. Está Entonces, ¿cómo los incorporamos? ¿Cómo incorporamos estos recursos humanos que se van a formar? ¿Cómo hacemos para que los que ya están en Pemex no regresen a hacer lo mismo, pero ahora con un doctorado en Texas A&M o en, en el Instituto Fonsedu Petrol, lo que sea? Este, no tenemos todavía esa flexibilidad, es uno de los objetivos de la reforma. ¿Cómo integramos los proyectos, esto es todavía más delicado, los proyectos de investigación que tienen éxito, están sujetas a las mismas y rígidas formas de la auditoría de cualquier organismo público. Miren, hay un caso emblemático. El IMP desarrolló a pedido de Pemex un proyecto para mejorar la calidad del crudo. Bueno, el proyecto es un éxito en laboratorio. No ha habido manera de pasarlo a escala semiindustrial porque en caso de que no resulte al momento de pasar de una escala a otra, el funcionario que haya firmado ese proyecto se puede ir al bote por daño patrimonial. Entonces, ese es el tamaño de las cuestiones que tenemos que arreglar en Petróleos Mexicanos y que yo espero que con la reforma, que con una auténtica autonomía de gestión se nos permita, porque si no vamos a seguir, eh, como lo ha dicho nuestro director general, este, con muchísimas dificultades para retener el talento, o sea, no, no, no sobran los ingenieros petroleros. Vamos a, a seguir convirtiendo, para premiarlos a pésimos ingenieros, los, los convertimos en, a, a excelentes ingenieros los convertimos en pésimos gerentes. ¿no? No, no, no encontramos otra manera de... Porque no hay una carrera diferenciada. ¿no? Entonces, si queremos darle un salario mejor a un buen ingeniero, pues hay que convertirlo en un gerente y a ver cómo nos sale de gerente, ¿no? porque son habilidades eh, distintas. Y termino con el, con el tema de la corrupción. Yo creo que esto va justamente, eh, lo que he platicado va en ese sentido, ya no es decir... Lo, para atacar la corrupción tenemos que cambiar la orientación de la supervisión y de la vigilancia y de las, de las auditorías. Eh, se, ha, se ha hecho ya un esfuerzo en Pemex eh, con la creación de la unidad de, de control eh, interno para justamente que ya no sigamos verificando los procedimientos. Miren, lo que hace un pillo... lo primero que hace es aprenderse el procedimiento, pues eso es lo que sabe para poder saber como alguien que va a armar una caja fuerte, pues lo primero es que le busca la combinación. Entonces, efectivamente, es lo mismo. Entonces, tenemos que cambiar ese enfoque y no creo que sea cuestión de, de, de que haya una mayor intervención en la vida interna de Pemex, ni de la CNH, ni la de CNR, porque hasta donde sé los funcionarios bajan con un, viajan con un pasaporte igualito al mío, con el nombre cambiado nada más. 
I would like to thank all of our panelists to Fluvio, Jeff, Marcelo, Lisa. Thank you so much for being here. Before I let you go, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to state that this is the last event that will, has been organized by two of our favorite staff here, Alison Cordell and Miguel Salazar, who will be leaving us at the end of this week. I wonder if you wouldn't mind giving them a round of applause. Miguel has been furiously tweeting away at the back, and Ali has been running around, as she always does, making sure that everything runs smoothly. Thank you both for all of your hard work throughout the years. I know that this is just one of the million celebrations that we're having this week uh, in honor of you, um, but thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention. We promise you that as soon as we have secondary legislation, we'll be having another event that we can actually analyze what the, uh, the legislature has passed. Thank you so much. Gracias. Gracias.